Up to this point, we have been using a unit circle approach to trigonometry uh, for this, this section through pre-cal. Today in chapter seven, we're going to start with a right triangle approach to trig. Now, this is very, very similar to what we've already been doing. And if you look down at the theorem in the box where it uh, redefines your six trig functions, you're going to recognize that I have already given it to you this way. I've already introduced to you the concept of R as the hypotenuse or the radius of the circle. Um, so a right triangle approach versus a unit circle approach to trig, very, very similar. You're, you're not going to notice much different. Um, so our values of the trig functions have been found so far by looking at circles with a radius of R. Another way to find the values of the trig functions is to look at right triangles. Now, we've been using a right triangle, but we've been using a right triangle that's been um, built on a circle in standard position. Now we're going to talk about any right triangle that is just floating around in space anywhere. And this is where we get into our application problems a lot more readily. All right, so we're looking at our right triangle approach. A right triangle is a triangle where one of our angles is 90 degrees, a right angle, and the side opposite this angle is our hypotenuse of our triangle. Now, because the um, three angles in a triangle add to 180, when I build a right angle, that takes up half of the available degrees that is the sum of the three angles in the triangle. So this is 90 degrees. That means that the other two angles split the other 90 degrees. So these two angles are always going to be complementary. They're going to add to 90 degrees, which means they're both going to be acute. So we have a right angle and two acute angles in time we have a right triangle. Triangles are um, proportional so that the longest side is opposite the largest angle. Since my right angle is my largest angle, that means the hypotenuse, the side opposite that angle, is going to be my longest side. My shortest side will always be opposite the smallest angle. And then, of course, my medium, my medium or middle size side is going to be opposite that middle angle. Um, Okay, uh, hypotenuse, the other two sides we call legs. So we have a hypotenuse and two legs when we are addressing it a right triangle. And we use our Pythagorean theorem, a square plus b square equals c square, which we have been using, but we have been using in kind of a distance formula look, x square plus y square equals r square, where r is our hypotenuse, and then X and Y correspond to A and B, the legs of the triangle. So take the following right triangle, place it in standard position on the Cartesian plane, and you can see that that right triangle and the circle are related. The radius of the circle is the same as C, our hypotenuse of our right triangle. Okay, so here are our relationships between X, Y, and R. And when we convert those into terms of our right triangle, A, B, and C, just remember that anywhere you had an R, that is the same thing as C. So sine, for example, if I have placed this right triangle into standard position, B is the same thing as my Y segment, A is the same thing as my X segment. So that sine would be B over C, and its reciprocal cosecant, therefore, would be C over B. Cosine would be A over C, and its reciprocal would be C over A. Tangent would be B over A, and cotangent A over B. Now, what if our angle is not in standard position? So that's the next step there. What if our angle, our right angle, um, isn't over here on the tri on the circle that our angle that we're looking at is not in standard position. Well, if our angle isn't in standard position, we can see we know what side C is. We know that R would be C, the hypotenuse. But suddenly these legs, we can't we don't know which one we want to reference as X and which one we want to reference as Y. So we have to refer them another way. 
Um, let's look at this angle, theta, as the angle we are interested in. So if I'm considering theta as the angle we are interested in, I see that the side opposite the right angle is my hypotenuse. That one's established. These two sides are the two that we need to think of a way to, to talk about. Well, this side is opposite the angle I'm interested in, and this side is adjacent to the angle I'm interested in. It's opposite because it does not it is not one of the sides of the angle, and this one is adjacent. It is one of the rays, one of the segments that makes up that angle that I'm looking at. Now, this relationship, these sides are going to change depending on what angle I'm interested in. I want you to think about sketching this triangle here, assuming this is the same triangle, and we have A, B, and C, where C is our hypotenuse. But what if, instead of looking at this as angle theta, what if this is my angle theta? What if this is the angle I'm interested in? Well, this side B is not opposite this angle. Side A would be opposite. And side B now would be adjacent. So which leg is opposite and which leg is adjacent is determined by what our angle is that we are focused on. Okay, let's look at that next page. Now the definitions of the trig functions need to be defined in terms of the relationship between the angle we're interested in and the lengths of the sides. So sine, where sine was previously thought of as y over r, sine is now going to be referenced as the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Now remember, r is always hypotenuse. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine would be the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Tangent would be opposite over adjacent. And then we have the reciprocal functions of those three. So instead of opposite over hypotenuse, now we have hypotenuse over opposite. Now we have hypotenuse over adjacent and adjacent over opposite. Now a lot of you have learned this in high school trig as SOHCAHTOA. So that's the, the mnemonic device that a lot of people use is SOHCAHTOA where sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and then tangent is opposite over adjacent. I don't typically re reference it that way, but you are welcome if that is helpful to you. We always need to find the things that help us to remember. Okay, example one. We're going to find the exact value of the six trig functions of angle theta in the figure below. Now we know which one angle theta is because it is marked. So automatically, when we see what angle theta is, we can determine which side is opposite and which side is adjacent. Well, this side is going to be opposite angle theta. This side is C, my hypotenuse. So let's say label that as hypotenuse. This is going to be opposite, which means we don't know the length of the adjacent side, the side that is adjacent to theta. But we can find the length of that side using our Pythagorean theorem. We know that it's one of the legs, and it doesn't matter whether we designate it as leg A or leg B. That makes absolutely no difference. So let's just say it's A. So the length of A is going to be the square root of, and then we have C squared, which is going to be 10 squared, minus our other leg squared. Well, that simplifies to give us the square root of 51. Square root 51 is not going to simplify any further. We want to leave it exact. So that is the side of, that's the length of our adjacent side in this triangle. Why did I pick positive? Well, because we are not on a unit circle. We are dealing with positive distance measures. So we don't worry about plus or minus. We automatically assume that it's going to be positive because it's a measure, it's a distance, it's a length. Okay. Use the definition of the trig functions from our exploration, our SOHCAHTOA, if you want to use, think about the mnemonic, um, 
to find the values of our six trig functions. So our three major functions are sine theta, cosine theta, and tangent theta. After we find those three, we're going to come back and find the reciprocal functions, cosecant theta, secant theta, and cotangent theta. Okay, so sine is opposite over hypotenuse. This is opposite, that's hypotenuse. So that sine is going to be 7 over 10, which means cosecant is 10 over 7. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so square root 51 over 10. Secant, therefore, is 10 over the square root 51, which then rationalizes to 10 square roots of 51 over 51. And finally, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So 7 over square root 51, which we can rationalize, or uh, cotangent then is square root 51 over 7. So we had to rationalize secant and tangent. And then we have the other four. Okay, complementary angles. Now I already told you this, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk through it and work through it. Find the ratios below given the following figure. Now notice that we are naming our angles with capital letters and the side opposite the angle is given a lowercase letter with the angle that it corresponds to. So this is angle B, this is side B because it's opposite angle B. Angle is capital, side is lowercase. So for the sine of angle B, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is going to be B, hypotenuse is side C. Cosine of angle B is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. Ah, uh, guys, I told you lowercase and then I, I wrote them uppercase, I'm sorry. Now let's go look at angle A. Sine of A, opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of A is the side adjacent to that angle over hypotenuse. Now what do you notice about these four ratios? Well, they pair up. Hopefully you see that um, my sine of angle B is the same ratio as the cosine of angle A. Sine of angle B is equal to the cosine of angle A. And then the cosine of B has the same ratio as the sine of A. Because of this relationship, sine and cosine are called cofunctions. In addition, a similar relationship exists with tangent and its cofunction, cotangent. And, well, cosecant is the cofunction of secant. Why are these ratios equivalent? Well, because as I said previously, our two um, acute angles in a right triangle are always going to be complementary because their sum is going to be 90 degrees. The right angle takes up 90 degrees out of the 180 degrees available in your triangle. So the other two will always be complementary. Our cofunction theorem, our complementary angle theorem, gives us our cofunction identities. Our complementary angle theorem tells us that the cofunctions of complementary angles are equal. Now, the difference between cofunctions and reciprocal functions. We've been focusing on functions and their reciprocals so far. You can remember which pair up as cofunctions because they have that CO co with it. So you have tangent and its cofunction, cotangent. You have secant and its cofunction, cosecant. And then, of course, sine and cosine, its cofunction. Use the complementary angle theorem. If I know sine of 35 degrees, what other um, trig function value do I know? Well, the cofunction of sine is cosine. What's the complement of 35 degrees? Complementary angles add to 90 degrees. So if I start with 90 and subtract my given angle, I can discover what its uh, complement is. 
So if I know the sine of 35 degrees, I also know the cosine of 55 degrees because co-functions of complementary angles are equal. You have to find both things. You have to identify the co-function and you have to identify the complement. So for B, I would have, I would, if I know tangent of pi third, I also know the cotangent of the complement of pi third. Well, what's the complement of pi third? Well, they're going to add to 90, which is the same thing as pi half. So I want to start with pi half and subtract pi thirds. I need a, a common denominator of 6 here. 3 pi 6 this is the same thing as pi half. 2 pi 6 this is pi third. So my complement here is pi six. And then I've got secant of pi 12. If I know the value of secant of pi 12, I also know the value of its co-function of the complement of pi 12. So what is the complement of pi 12? Well, I start with my pi half and I subtract pi 12 and I figure out that the complement of pi 12 is 5 pi 12. All right, solving our right triangles. When you solve a right triangle, that means you are going to have six pieces of information. You're going to know the value or the measure of all three angles, and you are going to know the length of all three sides. So you have solved a triangle when you have all six pieces of information. Now you're going to start by being given three pieces of information. Um, for this particular triangle, the three pieces of information I've been given are two angles. I see that this is a right angle and this angle is 35 degrees. And one of my sides, I know side length B. I need to solve for angle B, side C, and side A. Now, whenever I know two angles, the easiest thing in the world is to find the measure of that third angle. Think about this. If I know, for example, that angle C is 90 degrees, and I'm told that angle A is 35 degrees, then what's the measure of angle B? Well, together these three angles have to sum to 180. I know that this is 90, so these two are complementary. And, and previously, just at the top of the page, I discovered that the complement of 35 degrees is 55 degrees. So I just found my first piece of information. Now I need to find the missing two side measures. Remember that you always want to use your givens when possible, so I'm going to write that off to the side to remind us. Um, use the givens when it's possible. If I absolutely can't use given information, that's fine. Uh, for example, I'm pretty confident here that I've got 55 degrees correct, but just in case I made a mistake, I want to use angle A if at all possible. And it is possible. Um, I can use trig functions with angle A and side B. So this is the angle that is my given angle. Um, I know the side adjacent, so let's start by calculating cosine of 35 degrees because the cosine of 35 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent side is 8. Hypotenuse I don't know. That's my side C. So that's what I need to discover. So I'm solving for C. Um, to solve for C, I'm going to need to rearrange these terms. I need to move C over to the left side and cosine 35 degrees over to the right. Algebraically, when I do that, I multiply both sides by C and then I divide out this cosine of 35 degrees. What I end up with is side C equal to 8 divided by cosine of 35 degrees. That is what I plug into my calculator. Now we're going to be rounding, it says, um, it gives us rounding instructions here. Round the lengths of the sides to two decimal places, and if I need to, round angle measures, round angle measures to one decimal place. This is what I'm going to plug into my calculator. I need to make sure that I'm in degree mode because my angle is given to me in degrees. So I'm in degree mode. I'm going to take 8 divided by cosine of 35 degrees. And I get a side length of 9.766, etc. Rounding to two decimal places as instructed, I have approximately 9.77. I don't have a unit here, so I don't need to, to worry about units because I'm not given one. Okay, we found side C. We still need to find side A using only givens. 
Well, that means I'm using my 35 degree angle and side B. This would be opposite and, high and adjacent. That's tangent function. So tangent of 35 degrees equals opposite over adjacent. The opposite side A is what I don't know. To solve this equation for A, I just need to multiply both sides by 8. So A is going to be equal to 8 times the tangent of 35 degrees. I'm still in degree mode in my calculator, so I'm good there. So I'm going to say 8 times the tangent of 35 degrees. And I get rounding to two decimal places. I'm going to record that trailing zero. Even though there's, it doesn't change the value, I was instructed to give two decimal places. So it's wrong if I don't give two decimal places. To verify these measures are reasonable, you need to verify that your triangle is truly proportional, just like we talked about. The length of the side opposite the smallest angle needs to be that shortest side length. The side um, opposite the hypotenuse should be the longest side. So this is my smallest angle. A is the shortest side measure. This is my largest angle, C is the longest side measure when I compare the measures of the three sides. So we're in good shape, it makes sense. Okay, use the right triangle below to solve, round the length of each side to two decimal places and the angle to one decimal place and we are going to use givens everywhere we can. Um, this time I'm given two sides and only one angle. I know this is 90 degrees, I don't know the measure of this third of angle A or B and I don't know the length of side C. So I'm going to use all the givens I can use. Let's start by discovering, um, let's start by finding our angles maybe. If we go for angle A first, well I have not the hypotenuse so I'm going to be using tangent of angle A and tangent of angle A is opposite over adjacent, so 4 over 7. Well, I've already got it kind of solved for A. How would I finish solving for A? Well, I'm going to take the inverse tangent. What I know is the length or the measure of tangent. I need the angle, so I'm using tangent inverse. So I think about this as taking inverse tangent of both sides so that what I plug into my calculator is tangent inverse of 4 sevenths. And what I'm going to get out, as long as I'm in degree mode, is an angle measurement in degrees. So I do tangent inverse of 4 divided by 7. And I get an angle measure of 29, it's said to round angles to one decimal place, so 29.7 degrees. So angle A is approximately 29.7 degrees. Now I don't have to use tangent to find the measure of angle B because now I know two angle measures. I know that this is going to be complementary to B. So the sum of A and B would be 90 degrees. Therefore, that means angle B has to be approximately 60.3 degrees because 90 minus 29.7 is 60.3 degrees. Notice, again, approximate because this was rounded. That means this is effectively rounded as well. Now, if possible, I do not want to use these found values to find side C. I want to use only my givens. Well, I was given the other two sides. The way I can use givens to find that third side length is to use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So C is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the other two sides, the two legs. Now I was told that I can round this. I can round this to two decimal places. Um, this gives me 49 plus 16, which is 50, 65, square root 65, correct? And, oh, clear. Square root of 65 comes out to be rounded to two decimal places, approximately. 8.06. Now you know what's a side and what's an angle because angles are capitals, sides are lowercase. My uppercase and lowercase c is kind of tricky, but I always designate 
angle C to be um, the right angle so that side C is the hypotenuse so that my Pythagorean theorem that I've memorized makes sense. So if I ever give an angle measure for C, I know it's, an, it's, it's C is capital because it's 90 degrees. Okay, sorry, that was a little wandery. When we start uh, focusing on our right triangle trig, that's when we can really start focusing in on our application problems. Now, a lot of people take trig rather than precal because instead of working their way up through the precalculus sequence, they're doing something that is going to use a lot of trigonometry in their job, something that uh, with engineering, uh, construction, management, uh, there anything, anytime you're doing carpentry and construction work, you're using a lot of trig. Um, people who, surveyors who go out and survey roads will use a lot of trig. And yes, we do have uh, equipment that does a lot of the calculations for us, but if you don't know what it is you're calculating. If you don't understand the concepts and how the numbers work together, you're not going to know if you've got a good value or not. So you can't kind of double check your numbers and make sure that they make sense. Okay, finding the width of a river. A surveyor can measure the width of the river by setting up a transit at point C on one side of the river, taking a siding of a point A on the other side. Referring to the figure below, this figure right here, after turning through an angle of 90 degrees, so they take a measurement here, they take a siding, they turn 90 degrees, and then walk. he walks a distance of 300 meters to point B. So he walks a distance of 300 meters to point B. Using the transit now at B, they set up their equipment at B, and they are able to measure this angle from from this point to A, and they find that this angle measure here at B is 25 degrees. So 25 degrees is angle B. What's the width of the river rounded to the nearest meter? So that rounding instruction is important. The width of the river round, rounded to the nearest meter. So I'm not being asked to solve the entire triangle. I'm being asked to find the length of side B because that represents the width of the river. Now, if this is the angle I know, angle B, and I know side A, this side is adjacent, I need opposite. I don't care about hypotenuse. If I need opposite, I know adjacent, that's tangent function. So I've got tangent of 25 degrees is equal to opposite over adjacent. And then I solve for B, I rearrange my three terms so that I have B is equal to 300 times the tangent of 25 degrees. Plug that into my calculator, and I'm told to round it to the nearest meter. So let's see what that gives us. If we have 300 times the tangent of 25 degrees, we get 139.89. So that would be 139.9 that rounds us to 140 meters. So when we round it to the nearest meter, we get it looking like it rounded to the nearest 10 meters, but that is correct. Okay, angle of elevation and angle of depression. Another classical trig problem involves determining the height of something without being able to take a, a measuring up to the top. It could be a tree, a flagpole, um, a mountain, a lighthouse, whatever it is. Now here's how the surveyor does that. They measure the distance from the base to some location and then measure the angle of elevation. So an angle of elevation is always from a horizontal up. An angle of depression is always from a horizontal down. So if you're standing on the ground and measuring something tall, you're working with an angle of elevation, horizontal up. If you're standing at the top of a mountain and you're measuring down, you're going an angle of depression because it's from the horizontal down. Given that the horizontal distance from the tree is 48 feet, so right here, our distance from the base of our tree is 48 feet, the angle of elevation to the top of the tree is 65 degrees. How tall is the tree? Well, this is the measurement we're looking for. You know what? We're going to call it H for height. That makes more sense. We want to know the height of the tree. Well, we've got opposite and adjacent, so we're dealing with tangent of 65 degrees is H over 48, opposite over adjacent. Therefore, H is going to be 48 times the tangent of 65 degrees. 
and it did not give us a rounding instruction, did it? Let's just round, let's go ahead and round to, we've been rounding measures to two decimal places, so let's round this to two decimal places. 48 times the tangent of 65 degrees gives us 102.94, approximately 102.94, and we do have unit here, so always include your units when you have them. Let's make this problem more realistic by saying the surveyor's instrument is five feet above the ground. Well, five feet above the ground because either you're at eye level or you've got your instrument that you're taking the measurement with on the pedestal, right? So if that's the case, then we've got to add five feet into our answer, which gives us 107.94 feet, or approximately 108 feet. Suppose you also want to know the distance from the survey point to the top of the tree. Well, how could I figure that out? The distance from the survey point to the top of the tree, that would be this line of sight line right there. If I want to know that, what would I do? Well, I know this angle and I know this measure. That would be hypotenuse, right? Um, so I could use, this is adjacent to 65, I could use cosine of 65 degrees because this would be adjacent over hypotenuse. What else could I do? Well, now that I know the height of the tree, now this one would use a found value, but now that I know the height of the tree, I know this side and that side, so it would be possible to use the Pythagorean theorem to find C, my third side, but this one does rely, it relies on a found value. This way relies only on givens. But that one relies on one of the values that I found. So if this measurement were off, then my next answer is going to be off as well. Okay, we've got a couple more examples here. Angle of elevation and angle of depression again. From the edge of a thousand foot cliff. So remember I said it, uh, these angles are always from a horizontal up or a horizontal down. This is from a horizontal down, so it's an angle of depression. So from the edge of a thousand foot cliff. This is my thousand foot cliff. Two cars are in the valley below. Um, my angle of depression is 10 and 15 degrees. So I've got car A and I've got car B. And my angle of depression from this horizontal, because I think about looking out over that horizontal, down to one of the cars is going to be 15 degrees. And the angle of depression to the other car is going to be 10 degrees. How far apart are the cars? Well, I'm, I'm asking about this distance. How far apart are the cars? So I've got to do a little bit of work for that, right? I have two different right triangles that I'm looking at. I've got this first one to this car, whoops, right there. Now, I do have a right triangle here as well, but it's easier for me it's just easier for me to build it this way. So for this being 15 degrees, this is a thousand feet, right? And I need to know, um, what do I need to know? I need to know, this would be opposite. I need to know adjacent. I'm gonna make this X for adjacent, this distance from here to there, because that's how far away from the cliff car A is. So let's do that. Let's do tangent of 15 degrees is opposite would be a thousand over adjacent. That's this distance from here to here. Uh, to solve for x, I multiply both sides by x and then I divide both sides by tangent of 15 degrees. When I plug that into my calculator, so I plug in a thousand divided by tangent of 15 degrees, it's in degree mode, I get 3,732.05 feet.
we're going to keep our two decimal places. So x is 3,732.05 feet. That's this distance right here, 3,732.05 feet. Now we're going to move to our 10 degree. So the 10 degree goes all the way over here to B, and I'm going to call it Y. It's all the way from the cliff out to car B. So I can tell immediately it should be further, right? So let's do tangent of 10 degrees this time. That opposite side is still 1,000, but now we're measuring this distance that's further out. So I have y is equal to 1,000 divided by tangent of 10 degrees. And when I plug that into my calculator, round it to two decimal places, you should get 5,671.28 feet. So this distance from here to there is 5,671.28 feet. Now neither one of those distances is the answer to my question. The answer to the question is how far apart are the cars? So it's going to be the difference between these two. And I see that they come out to be about 1939.2 apart. Um, if I do 5671.28 minus my uh, 3732.05, I get 1939.23 feet apart. Okay, bearing. Um, bearing problems you typically see if you are doing some type of navigation either on in the air or on water. Um, I am a Texas girl, so I have never gone sailing. I have I've never worked with navigation in with bearing problems and navigation in this way. You also see it with aircraft. Um, you see bearing instruction type problems with GPS coordinates and things like that. Okay, navigating and surveying, surveying the direction or bearing from a point O to P is denoted by the symbolism, for example, in 30 degrees E, so north 30 degrees east. Now what this means is from this point I have gone to the north and then 30 degrees east of north. So from point O this ray is north 30 degrees east. This point P3 is north 30 degrees west of center of O. And then these two rays are going to be south, south 50 degrees west, south 20 degrees east. What you need to remember for bearing problems is your compass rows. So my compass rows north to south, up to top to bottom, and then west to east spells the word we. So that's how you can help remember which direction, um, which is if you are directionally challenged. Um, you can tell that I've had to think it through. So an aircraft takes off from the airport. Oh, it, it asks us about, it doesn't give us the bearing for P4. P4 would be um, south 20 degrees east. That's the one it doesn't give us. Okay, now let's do our word problem. An aircraft takes off from the airport with a bearing of north 45 degrees west. It flies for two miles, turns 90 degrees, heads southwest. The plane goes one more mile what bearing should the, um, the control tower use to locate the aircraft? So let's, let's sketch this. Anytime you have bearing and navigation problems, you need to start with a sketch. Our sketch is going to start at the airport. The plane takes off from the airport with a bearing of north 45 degrees west. So from the airport north, and then we are going to rotate 45 degrees to the west. So this is 45 degrees west of north. It flies for two miles. So the distance along this flight is two miles. Then it turns 90 degrees and heads southwest. Well, southwest from here, south and to the west. So we need a 90 degree angle here to the southwest. All right, this is a 90 degree angle, whether it looks like it or not. It's just a really rough sketch. The plane goes one mile in this direction. 
What bearing should the control tower use to locate the aircraft? So we are trying to, we want to know from the airport at what bearing is the plane now? Now we have a nice little right triangle here. If we calculate this angle theta, then the sum of these two angles will give us the bearing that the plane, the airport would need. I know that I'm going to be going north and west. So north something west. But I need to know this bearing from north. What is this entire rotation to get to the plane? Well, let's let's do some let's do some trig. I want this angle theta, and I have the side opposite and the side adjacent, so I'm working with tangent. Tangent of theta is one over two, opposite over adjacent. That means I need tangent inverse. If I take the tangent inverse of both sides, theta is tangent inverse of one half. So I'm in degrees, I'm interested in degree mode. Um, tangent inverse of one divided by two, and I get an angle measure. Uh, we've been rounding angles to one decimal place, so 26.6 .6 degrees. So theta is 26.6 .6 degrees, but that's not the answer to my question. The question is, what bearing should the control tower use to locate the aircraft? Well. The plane started by rotating a bearing north 45 degrees west. It has gone another 26.6 degrees. So the bearing the airport needs to use is 71.6, north 71.6 degrees west to find the plane. Okay, very good.